If you would take your copy of God's Word and open with me to John chapter 3. Over the next few weeks, really from now till Easter, we'll be looking at different conversations that Jesus had with people uh, as he journeys really from the beginning of his ministry to the cross. We're calling these crucial conversations. And perhaps there's no more crucial conversation someone had with Jesus in the pages of the New Testament than John chapter three. We're gonna start with just the first three verses, but keep your Bible open. We'll be looking at almost the entire first half of chapter three. It says, now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Father, we pray today that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Many of you have noticed uh, what has happened at Asbury College. It's made the news. It's on all sorts of religious news stations, but there's even been an article in the New York Times. On February 8th, they had an ordinary chapel service. Now, I went to Texas A&M. They didn't require chapel at Texas A&M, uh, but there are other schools, religious schools, that require chapel. Uh, all of you who went to religious schools where they had chapel, go ahead and raise your hand. Yeah, you had to go to chapel. Uh, when I got to seminary, we had to go to chapel. And I'll just let you know, when you have to go to chapel every week, those don't tend to be the most dynamic services in the world. Uh, you know, required attendance at chapel doesn't do a whole lot for the liveliness of what's happening there. And yet on February the 8th, they had an ordinary chapel service. The pastor that was in charge of the service that day gave a, a simple sermon on confession and then they dismissed only some people never left. And really up until just this past week, people continued to pray and gather. At times, as many as 15,000 people a day were gathering there uh, in order to worship the Lord together. It's been called a, a revival. And however you think of that, it's clear that something unique and special has happened over the last few weeks what, what's struck me is not just that that's happened, that's a gift from God's spirit, and I'm grateful that that's happening in those college st students' lives. What's been remarkable to me are all the people from all over really the world who caught wind of this and decided that the best thing that they could possibly do was to get on an airplane and travel to Asbury to see for themselves what was happening. Now, there were all sorts of people who did that. There are lots of people with their own Instagram page did that, if you know what I mean, right? So they, they're traveling there because they want to have some sort of, uh, you know, ability to judge what's happening and then talk about it on whatever their social media platforms were. Anytime something big is happening, there are those who try to capitalize on it in order to draw attention to themselves. I saw one person who went there just to make sure that this guy took it upon himself to make sure they had the right kind of theology for this thing going to happen. That... Uh, you know, as if their own professors and pastors couldn't handle that. Uh, in the midst of that, though, I'm sure there were genuine seekers, people who all of their life have had a deep yearning for a real encounter with God's Spirit, and they heard of something happening, and they traveled because they just wanted to be open to the possibility that we live in a world where God moves among us. You're here on a Sunday morning in a day and age where people no longer feel obligated to go to worship each and every week. My guess is you too would know what it is to have that yearning to be in a place where God moves. When we open the Bible today and see the story of Nicodemus coming to visit with Jesus, I think because we've heard this story so many times, it's, it's kind of hard for us to hear it anew. Uh, Nicodemus, of course, was a Pharisee. And we know that throughout the scriptures, the Pharisees and Jesus don't often get along. And, and yet, if we could take a step back, the Pharisees were really the people in Jesus's day who also had a yearning to see God move. 
you and I lived back in Jesus' day and we kind of took our personalities and our desires and the things that we thought were important and we just found a crowd in Jesus' day to hang out with. I know that we've, we've stereotyped the, the Pharisees as stick in the muds, but, but these were actual people who longed for God to move, not just in the temple, but in everyday life. They had a real yearning to see revival happen in their land. There's another group called the Sadducees. They were really the stick in the muds and they don't get a whole lot of attention in the Bible because they were such stick in the muds, they weren't gonna show up at anything where people thought the spirit was moving. They only used the first five books of the Bible. Uh, they thought everything else, you were just being liberal. I mean, if you read the Psalms and, and the other writings and the, the, what can, can became known as our Old Testament, they thought that was way too liberal for them. We're just gonna stick with the first five books of the Bible. They also colluded with the Romans. Their whole goal was just to stay out of trouble, honestly, right? And then you had the zealots. Their whole goal was to get into trouble with the Romans. They were the, always the one collecting the swords and getting ready for battle. The Pharisees were a different crowd. They were more like us. They were folks who thought ordinary people could study their Bibles and see what God commanded and then do their very best to obey. They were people who yearned yearn to see God move in the world. And so here we have Nicodemus. Again, in John's gospel, this is early in the story. So perhaps the Pharisees haven't had all that sort of time to figure out that Jesus said a lot of things like they said, but said them in enough of a different way that it made most of them uncomfortable. That part of the story hasn't happened yet. Nicodemus is coming because he has sensed in Jesus a real movement of the Spirit of God and he wants to know, is this the real deal? I think we can be sympathetic to that spirit, can't we? We've made a lot through the years about the fact that he came at night. It is true that John plays a lot into the image of light and darkness. He opens up his gospel by saying the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not understood it. Certainly, Nicodemus, as he comes at night, a teacher of the law, someone who is seeking God's presence and is so close, but yet uh, like so many of us in our zeal, uh, so far away, he is representative of the darkness that does not understand the light that has come to dwell in our midst. And still, he comes to Jesus to such kind words. Verse two, he says, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. It's as strong a statement of faith as we've had yet in John's gospel of someone who recognizes in Jesus that God is at work but as will happen again and again in Jesus's ministry, and honestly, any conversation we have with him day to day, Jesus doesn't always abide by our flattery. Instead, he jumps right to the heart of the matter. He says in many of your translations, if you've got an old King James, verily, verily, or perhaps some translations say, amen, amen. The NIV softens it a little bit and says, very truly, I tell you. Uh, it, it softens it because really to, to declare something, amen, amen, was a way of saying, what? I am about to say is not up for negotiation. What I am up to say is an essential, what I'm about to say is an essential truth of all the world. Jesus says, verily, verily, amen, amen. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now again, I almost want to hit a pause button right here. Because again, many of you, you come to church every week and maybe for one or two of you, you've never heard this phrase born again. But for many of us in Baptist church life, this is just, I mean, we could almost toss out all the rest of the Bible as long as we get to keep John three sixteen, right? And so we've, we've heard this so often that perhaps we, we miss the startling nature of Jesus's words that no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Nicodemus had probably never, ever heard that phrase. It wasn't a phrase that was common in his day and age. It did get used in a few rabbinic writings, but it was almost always applied, uh, in fact, never to a Jew, always to a Gentile who had converted to Judaism. If a Gentile had moved from his pagan ways of living to worship the one true God and become a Jew, they might say he had been born again. But Jesus here is moving in a different direction, saying it's not just the Gentile who can't see the kingdom of God unless he is born again no one, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Nicodemus, again, 
uh, he gets a bad rap. Uh, how could he know what Jesus was talking about? He, he at least keeps the conversation going and says, how, how can a man be born again? I don't think he was so dense to really think Jesus was talking about someone, you know, uh, being reborn by his actual biological mother, but he's simply saying, I don't, I don't get how you're applying this metaphor. Jesus presses once more, amen, amen. Truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. For flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. For the wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. So the Bible never gives us really as many details as we Westerners would like. If this was a novel, they would set the scene. I think they would then have, after Jesus says this, a nice pregnant pause as Nicodemus mulled over the words of Jesus. This talking about, about being born of the spirit, this talking about uh, the, the flesh, the spirit give, being born of water and the spirit uh, of the wind blowing would have really probably taken his mind to that great passage in the prophet Ezekiel, where God calls Ezekiel to go out into this, this field, really the field of Armageddon, where all of Israel lays low. Their army is nothing but a collection of dry bones. And God calls on Ezekiel the prophet to do what? Preach a sermon to dry bones. <laughs> and I imagine Ezekiel said, I've preached to a lot of rough audiences, God. I don't know about this one. And it says that the spirit of God began to move. God breathed on those bones and the bones begin to rattle and they begin to be drawn together back into a new, very alive army of God. It was a passage that spoke to the resurrection of all God's people. The way the rabbis saw it is this is to the resurrection of Israel. We will be great once more. It was really the yearning of everyone's heart, but especially the Pharisees. The Pharisees thought if they could just obey all the rules in the right way, if they could just live faithfully, that their faithfulness would itself be an act of prayer to God, calling on God to move so that when God would look down, he would perhaps in, in his graciousness ignore the complacency of the, Pharisee, of the Sadducees and he would ignore the troublemaking of the zealots, but he would see the faithfulness of the Pharisees and he would blow once again his spirit through Israel so that they could be great like they were in the days of King David, a yearning to be God's people in the world, a yearning that we all have, a yearning for God to do great things. But, but Jesus seemed to be doing something a little different here than what Nebus, Nicodemus probably expected. For once again, he used that short little phrase that still is powerful in what it excludes. He says, Nicodemus, no one, no one, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and spirit. No one, no one can really do the things that God wants them to do in the world unless God's spirit chooses to blow on them. Nicodemus probably began to understand that Jesus, is, and this is really what put him at odds with all of the Pharisees. They, they both yearned for God's kingdom come. That's what all these discussions were about. When is God's kingdom going to show up? The Pharisees wanted to see that, but they thought through their own efforts they could bring such things about. And Jesus reminds even the greatest teachers of the law, there will be no coming of the kingdom of God unless God's spirit moves among you. In fact, it goes so far as really to say, look, there's only one who can tell us about such things. Nicodemus asked, how, how can any of this be? Jesus says, you're Israel's teacher, aren't you? Don't, don't you understand such things? Then he begins to speak about the kingdom of God in such a way that he speaks with such authority and, and assurance that he speaks as one who has been there. And he talks about the son of man being in heaven and coming down. Really then gives Nicodemus an insight that could only be understood on the other side of Jesus' own death and resurrection. When in verse 14, he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. 
you have to know Nicodemus had no idea what that meant then, right? He knew the story from the Old Testament about the snake being lifted up, but how in the world could he imagine the death of Jesus on a cross and his resurrection from the grave? Again, it's not a novel. It doesn't tell us what happened next. I imagine there were still back and forth. I imagine at some point there was an awkward goodbye. And I imagine for the rest of his adult life, at least these next few years, while Jesus spread around the countryside, these words struck at the heart of his core. No one, Nicodemus, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born again. No one. And, and as he pondered those thoughts for the next few years, almost all of the Pharisees turned against Jesus. Why? Because they were not open to the idea that they themselves might need to be born again. Meanwhile, the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the people who really looked over in their society, the people who the Pharisees thought these people will be no help because they don't even know the commandments of God, much less obey them. These were being born again as they put their faith in Jesus Christ. And the very people that Nicodemus put his trust in, his fellow Pharisees, they became the very kinds of people they hated, colluders and people who were willing to compromise their values all because they saw Jesus as a threat. And what did G Nicodemus think? On the day he saw Jesus hung upon the cross, did Jesus's words come back to him? The son of man must be lifted high. We don't know exactly, do we? Bible, again, doesn't give us all those details that we would love to have. What we do know is that he and a buddy, Joseph of Arimathea, were at least drawn enough to the teachings of Jesus that at his death, Joseph went and asked Pilate for Christ's body, and he and Nicodemus were the ones responsible for seeing that he got a proper burial. Which means Nicodemus was there when they laid Jesus' body in that crypt was there remembering these words, Nicodemus, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Nicodemus, day is coming when the spirit of God will blow through this world and dead bones will rise. And I wonder if the yearning in his heart hit a new fever pitch. Oh, that God would move like that. We don't know, again, from the pages of scriptures, how Nicodemus responded after the resurrection. Church history tells us he believed. Whether he did or not, this crucial conversation has helped so many of us believe, hasn't it? Because it's given us the perfect picture of what salvation really means. Salvation is not that you and I have a zeal for God. Can we say that out loud to each other? Salvation is not that you and I have a zeal for God. Nicodemus and the Pharisees had a zeal for God. We'll meet another Pharisee who had a zeal for God. His name was Saul. We know him as Paul. They had zeal for God, but it was misdirected zeal. It was zeal that thought they could bring about the kingdom of God on their, up on their own efforts. Salvation is not what we do for God. Salvation is what God has done for us. And when we want to know whether or not something is the real deal, the question is not what are these people doing for God, but rather what is God doing for us? If we seek fresh movements of the Spirit, which I think we should, we should yearn for God's presence in our lives. It is dependent upon us remembering again and again and again. We are not the ones who do great things for God. God is the one who has done great things for us. And any movement in the world that brings up our zeal but does not lead us more and more into the lap of Jesus, friends, it is not God. For there is no hope, there is no peace, there is no life in any other place but in the one who was lifted high for our sins and in the one who rose from the grave to defeat death itself. We will find the life of the Spirit, friends, when we draw near to Christ. So Nicodemus's conversation still challenges. You and me who yearn for the spirit of God to move. Some of you think, you think you've spent all year thinking, if I, could, if I could just do this, if I could just be here, if I could just get all of these things right, then God will move mighty in my life. 
when the Bible points us in the other direction. That it's not about you and I getting everything right, but rather simply being right with God by putting our faith in the one who died for us. This is the good news, that God so loved you. Not, not that we so love God, right? The good news is this, that God so loved us. He sent his only son to die for us so that whosoever, right? Isn't that a nice counterpart to no one? Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but will have everlasting life. This is the message in which we have put our hope. Let us believe it with all of our hearts. Lord, we give you thanks for the good news of the gospel. That Lord, when we draw near to you all the time, we draw near with lots of questions. Lord, what should we do for you? That seems to be on the top of our list. And yet, Lord, you're constantly reminding us that the starting gate of our faith, and really the way we take every step forward is not based on the question, what can we do for you? It is based on the statement of what you have done for us. Lord, help us to be humble enough to put our faith in you, to trust that no matter how much the winds of culture are changing, that no matter how, how intimidating it may seem to live out our faith in the world, that genuine revival is not based upon what we do, but based upon the moving of your spirit. And so, Lord, what we ask more than anything else is not that we would do a good work for you, but that, Lord, once again, we would depend on you, the one who does good things for us. So, Lord, help us like Nicodemus to be willing enough to at least be curious, to draw near to you, whatever it takes, to ask the hard questions and to listen deeply to the stirring of your spirit in our own hearts that we might discover where true life is found, not in our own efforts, but in you. Lord, we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.